I've seen it so many times. It's we keep trying to resist as if there's going to be some magic. Well, it just won't exist and, and it's not going to be there and somehow it'll change itself. And really, that's where people start to struggle. And I know it's hard because change is always there attacking us in one way or another. Sometimes even it's the change we choose, which doesn't actually turn out the way we think it will. And so the more we can learn to accept the change as it comes, learn how to adapt to it in increments, then the easier it is going to be on our mental health. Anytime where I've tried to resist that change, the change just ended up being harder and harder to get through. Mm. I love that word resistance. I was learning a, a coaching program many years ago and my mentor demonstrated to me the process of resistance. If you're resisting something, you've got to push against it and it's got to push back against you. And the more you push and the more you resist, the more force it puts back to you. And eventually you topple over. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and that point that you made there, to accept and adapt, I believe that's very critical. And the SEALs, I think that's part of their motto. You've got to accept, adapt and respond to the change. Mm -hmm. And burying your head in the sand is not a form of acceptance. Uh, that's just denial. And then you go into that slippery slope of the grievance cycle. <laughs> and it all starts with denial, followed by anger. <laughs> How dare this happen to me <laughs> out of all people <laughs> with business people what are those signs and the symptoms because you know let's face it we're business people we're selling ourselves every day and I've got an ego and I'm not allowed to have a shortfall I've got to be perfect I can't make mistakes what are some of those signs and symptoms of when it has impacted the mental health yeah, and, and we've seen a lot of this lately, right, is as you know, I spent 20 years working in Silicon Valley and corporate jobs before I've, I've owned businesses, and a lot of change would happen to me, there would be restructuring, you get a new manager, we're giving you a new job as if it's a gift. And, you, you know, these choices in our life are taken away from us, or so it seems. But that's where it's time for us to take that power back. Even now, this constant struggle with am I in the office? Am I out of the office? You know, all these kind of high arrangements. At the end of the day, you have to decide what it is you want and make a move toward it because otherwise you will sit in that area of suffering and you're just not going to be happy. So you have to decide, am I going to accept this? Is this the way that it's going to be and I'm okay with it? Or do I need something different? And then just go make that decision. Even if you make the decision and it takes you three months, six months to go do something else, just making the decision can make you mentally healthier and able to go through each day. Currently in Australia, one in five Australians are medicated for a mental health issue and it's escalating. Uh, there was something like 65 million prescriptions dispensed in the last 12 months. And so the numbers show us it's out there, but the way that business people are communicating it, they're acting as if it's not there. They don't have the right verbiage. They're not externalising it. And I think this is a major problem with social media as well. It's highlights. Highlight the presupposition is just show me the best stuff. Show me the best stuff. But the real stuff happens day to day, moment to moment. It's that toxicity in the thinking. And it's that toxic thinking that starts to make you sick. A lot of people, as they get onto this journey of self-discovery, they start to realise that it's the thoughts that influence the feelings. And we have over 60,000 thoughts a day. 95% are on repeat. So if you've got those fears, those doubts and those limiting beliefs, that's going to rotate over and over and again. And the way that the human mind is wired is about 80% of our thoughts are negative in nature. So that alone, coupled with change, a nice gift from the employer, hey, here's a new job. <laughs> it all starts to stack, stack and stack. And I think for a lot of us, we don't know who to talk to. We don't know who to ask. And it happened to me, 2012, my wife lost her job when she was six months pregnant. Uh, she almost miscarried uh, three times. She lost uh, her financial stability. She had to move country. I stepped away from my job. I was co-leading a team of 17,500 cabin crew at Emirates. I was a senior flight should, and I had to walk away from a leadership job because I had to choose between family and career. So I moved to Taiwan, another country that I'm not familiar living with. I'm trying to start a business. We've got a new baby. And about six months into that journey, I started to have breathing problems. And I said to my wife, I said, 
I think I need to go to the hospital. She said, what's wrong? I said, I can't breathe. She said, well, let me take you to the doctor, first of all. So we went to the doctor's clinic. They said, look, we're too busy. Go to the hospital. I went to the hospital. They did some diagnostics. And the doctor looked at me and said, Mr. Tolson, there's nothing wrong with you. He said, it's all in your mind. Mm -hmm. And I went, oh, thanks. So he sent me to a psychologist who said I was depressed. And then I said, well, what do I do? And they said, take this medication. Now, I was opposed to it because of everything that I knew. You know, I should know how to navigate through this. I've got the tools, but I didn't really know how to take myself through that journey. And so I hopped on the medication. It was two or three weeks later. I just felt like a zombie. The eyes wouldn't open. The brain was foggy. And there was this numbness. It was like touching the skin, but not being able to feel it. And I knew that this problem had started to escalate and I needed help. So I've been there, but I was guided through that process and I got out the other side, but a lot still haven't. And so I think this really talks about resilience. And for you, resilience is something that you've learned, something that you've developed over the years. And I believe that you've built a lot of resilience through marathons. You have raced in seven marathons and you've competed in dozens of triathlons. During that process of time and experience, what did you learn about resiliency? Yeah, it, and I was an athlete from the very beginning. You know, as soon as I could walk, my mom had me tumbling. She was a collegiate gymnast. And so what happened when I started going into my corporate job is I just sat at a desk all day. I, I had zero movement. Maybe I went to a conference room and walked back, got to the kitchen and got some coffee and then fully caffeinated, you know, continued to do a few more emails. And it just didn't resonate with me physically. You know, you're internalizing all of this stress. Like you said, what goes on in your mind goes on in your body. And so I realized I needed an outlet to start just getting some exercise. And then I realized there was a lady in the office and she would go running before everyone else got there. There was these beautiful trails around the office there in San Francisco. And I said, well, let me just go with you. And so what started as just a very simple journey to relieve stress then became an outlet for competition. So all of this stress I felt that I was internalizing, now I could put a goal towards it, a physical goal that I could go run five kilometers, 10 kilometers and so on. And I never set out to run marathons and do all these things. I just needed an outlet to help me balance that stress that I was achieving every day. And the thing that happened too is, as I was running, as I was cycling, all these things, I had the ability to problem solve. All of a sudden, I'm not sitting in front of that computer. I'm not surrounded by other people, you know, trying to get answers from me. The only person who was going to find the answers was me. And so it really became this wonderful way for me to balance the stress of work while also getting exercise and physically staying active. And all of a sudden, problems and solutions just started magically coming together. And so I walked away feeling better, not just that I had gotten exercise, but that I was also problem solving and working while I was doing it. So. <laughs> and I'm sure a lot of people are going, well, good for you, Nikki, you like exercise. I'm one of those people who don't like exercise, but it's not all about just the exercise because there's some personality types that to get that anger out of the body, they need those high impact activities. But you get those people who are really social and you know, going to work is not always socializing. Sometimes you just gotta let the hair down, have a couple of drinks and have some fun and have some laughs. And that's another way that other people can do it. I've also found that some people, they just need to sleep. And according to some of the latest results coming out of America, 50% um, of the adult population have sleep deprivation. And half the problem is they're so tired that they can't mentally recover. They can't recharge that battery. And I've seen people who are just starting to get, you know, seven to eight hours of good sleep a night and they start to recover. They have the energy in the body to control their thoughts. They don't need the dopamine hits. They don't need the caffeine hits. And their energy levels come back up and they start to regulate those emotions. So for, for inoptimal health, if anybody is sleeping less than five hours per night, they're going to have sleep deprivation. And you're going to have brain fog. You're going to reach for the powdered donut. You're going to eat those sugary foods but that doesn't help you move forward. You know, in the studies of millionaires, on average, millionaires sleep six to seven hours per night. 
And it's not that sleep is expensive. Sleep is free. Sleep is cheap. It's just a discipline. And self-made millionaires, they make sleeping a priority. Even Jeff Bezos, uh, one of the richest men on the planet, he said with his executives, he wants them well rested. And in the study of billionaires, billionaires on average sleep seven to eight hours per night. Now, just because they're a billionaire doesn't mean their sleep's more expensive. It's still free. It's still very cheap. They just make it a discipline. And Jeff Bezos says that he wants his executives just to make three good decisions per day. But the prerequisite is that sleep. And I think if we can get that combination that you're talking about, you can do the physical activity, if that's your thing. You can go out and socialise, let the hair down, go to church, get on stage, sing, whatever floats your boat, or just get some really good sleep. And that in and of itself also attributes to that resilience. It's the recovery of the mind, the heart, the body, and also the soul. And it's such an important thing. And that's why I always tell people like, it, it really doesn't matter what your mode is. Even I didn't set out to run marathons. And that's not the answer. Sometimes it could be as simple as meditation, it could be a walk in the forest, it could be just getting outside right out of your rhythm. And and some people are very social and that social aspect alone can just lower your stress level, have someone to talk to just to commiserate with. Um, and then hopefully the sleep comes with it, you knock those other two things out, and then you just feel better when you actually lay in bed. You're actually more calm. You've had a good hygiene before you go to sleep. You're not like immediately checking email and then laying down with the phone two centimeters from your head, right? And I think doing these things can make you more resilient overall because then when you do have something that's very stressful that does need your attention, you can go do that. But that's not the regular day-to-day -day rhythm. It's just not sustainable. We weren't built to be able to do that. We were built to run away from a tiger, you know, and then hopefully we don't see a tiger for a while. <laughs> When you were competing in your marathons, what did you learn about resilience, especially when you become injured or you are fatigued? And, and how does that translate back to business or our careers? Yeah, it, in my books, I, I talk about some of these journeys because it's not like, oh, hey, you know, Nikki's a fabulous athlete and everything goes perfectly according to plan. I've had concussions. Uh, I woke up with a migraine on the day of a race one day. You know, there's races I just couldn't finish because of any number of things that happened. And I talk about those things because it's important to understand what our failures teach us as well. And, you know, I got so sick in the middle of a swim, I thought I wasn't even going to barely make it out of the water, let alone finish the race. But I did, because sometimes you have to realize this is the worst it's going to be, and it's only going to get better from here. And I will feel better if I go and take that next step, if I go do that next thing. A lot of us, we stop right in the middle of that stressful point and we never get over it. And that really, really holds us back. And you know, there's a self-care piece of it, but at the end of the day, it's knowing your limits, knowing how to gradually push them a little bit and a little bit more each week, mentally and physically. And then you also have a step back. In all of these training programs, you have a day where you're going to do less. You are going to recover. You may just chill and do some yoga. <laughs> so think about that way is that we don't always push, push, push. That's not how we achieve things. We do things in small increments, take that break and know when you can go a little bit harder. Mm -hmm. When I was wakeboarding, there was one person that uh, everybody respected and equally hated him just as much. And what they respected about him was that he could ride in any condition, where some athletes could only ride in perfect conditions. If there was no wind on the river, if there was no chop on the river, they could go out and do their perfect pass. But the guy that they respected and hated was he could do it in all conditions. If the conditions were perfect, he could do it. If they weren't optimal, he could do it. If there was two foot chop and a 25 kilometre hour win, he could still do it. And what I learned from observing that was you've got to be able to operate in all conditions. And not every day is going to be perfect. You know, anybody can be good when the conditions are right. But in business, the conditions are never going to be perfect. You know, we talk about the perfect storm, but very rarely is that perfect calm. And, and if you're setting new goals, if you're extending yourself, you're always moving out of the comfort zone. So you're going to navigate territory that you're not used to. And, and, and I loved that guy. I hated him because he was going to beat me every time. But I respected him because now, 20 years later, you, you get it. He did it in all conditions. 
And I've taught people that too. You know, one of my first businesses was coaching people through endurance events. And so what I said is, you know, it'd be like raining or, you know, the weather's not ideal. It's too hot. It's too cold, whatever Goldilocks problem we're having at the moment. And it's like, well, what are you going to do when that happens on race day? Because you have no control over the weather. That's definitely for sure. And you're going to be racing outside. So you might as well go through those conditions when you're training, when maybe if it really becomes bad, you can back off. So that way, when race day comes, you're ready for the main event. And we have to do that in all aspects of our lives. We have to be able to figure out how to go through those times, you know, when it's not ideal and we're kind of uncomfortable. So that way, if we're really uncomfortable, we kind of know how to navigate through all of that. Hmm. It's fascinating when I think about my time as an athlete. Ninety-nine percent of the time, we would have been in preparation. We would train during summer, autumn, winter, spring, and we would train for hours on end. We might go and ride non-stop for two or three hours. Would come home and would be on the trampoline for an hour or two hours. Would go to the gym. And then when the competition season come around, all you had was the ability to be on the water for 60 seconds. That was it. You had 60 seconds. But then I look at business. People are doing business all the time, but they don't stretch. They're very rarely preparing correctly. They, they might be shuffling papers, but not preparing mentally or emotionally, and they're not drilling down on their strategies. They're not rehearsing their scripts and dialogues. They don't do any of that, but they expect to make a million dollars. They expect to be world champions, but 99% of the time is doing, and less than 1% of time is in the preparation. And it's it's a dichotomy. It's on the top. It's the on the opposite end of the scale. <laughs> and I get confused. Come on, you got to prepare. You got to warm up. You got to drill, 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 drill. But yeah, number one thing my clients complain about is, well, I don't like selling, you know, I, I have trouble closing the sale. I, I get a lot of leads or, you know, I have a lot of opportunities, but those just don't materialize. And so I ask exactly that question. How often do you practice your sales pitch? Uh, practice to your cat, to your kids, to your partner. It really doesn't matter, but you need to practice it out loud every day, all the time. And you need to practice what those rejections are because that's how you get money in the door. If you're not so relaxed at that, that you can answer any question and respond to any rebuttal, you're not gonna make those sales. And that's when you're probably having good conversations with people you like and wanna work with. There'll be other times when you're gonna have something that's like a really big deal and you're gonna have really hard objections and you're not prepared because you haven't done that simple training, which should be happening 99% of the time, like you said. <laughs> my, my cousin said to me, if you wanna be good at sales, get into dating. I said, what do you mean? He said, go dating, you're going to experience rejection. And by the end of it, you'll be rejection proof and you'll make a million bucks in sales. <laughs> and he's right, because when I look at my wife, uh, she doesn't care about rejection. And she's an incredible saleswoman. She tells people up front, either you want it or you don't. It's okay. You're not going to offend me if you don't. Just tell me if you want it or not. If you do, excellent. If you don't, we're still going to be friends and we're going to move forward. You don't have to let me down slowly by a long email just get to the point and I find that ability for her to deal with rejection has really enabled her to grow in her career but she never takes it personally but what she's very good at is adapting adjusting and responding to all different types of people which I believe uh, you talk about in the chameleon mindset so what is the chameleon mindset and how can we benefit from it yeah, a lot of times chameleons get a bad rap and we've kind of been using this in a way of, well, it, it is that sort of ostrich in the sand as if we're pretending the problems aren't happening and we're just blending in so that no one notices us. And I actually read a scientific study which says nothing can be further from the truth. When a chameleon flashes its color, it's because something is wrong. It, it needs to adapt to what's going on in the environment. It's hungry, it's looking for a mate, it's trying to detract a predator. When it's green, when it's calm, when it's Zen, that's when you can't see it. It's camouflaged in the trees and it's doing okay. And so I really relate this to people and their businesses too, because so many times when we're suffering, when something's not right in our environment, we 
pretend we're green. We're, we're trying to hide and like, everything's fine. Don't worry about me. Nothing to see over here. When really what we need to be do is screaming, flashing our colors and saying, no, 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 this is not right. I need help with this in my business. I need help with this in my personal life. Whatever the things are, we're not sharing enough vulnerably and authentically to say, hey, here's where I need help and vice versa, seeing when others need help and reaching out to them. And the more I think that we can do this and better communicate with each other to really see what going it's going on between people, the better off we're all going to be. So that's kind of chameleon mindset in the nutshell. <laughs>